we spent uh, a good deal of time interviewing Anna Schwartz. I, yeah, um, <laughs> to the extent that I think at some point she was going to throw me out. Yeah. <laughs> Economists, not a group with a lot of Marys, Natashas, or Juanitas. And that's caused a lot of controversy. However, what's often overlooked are the actual female economists who are pushing economics forward by addressing real world issues. Welcome to Women in Economics. Oh, I should start again? Okay. Anna Jacobson Schwartz was one of the leading monetary economists of the 20th century. She was born in 1915, and she grew up in the Bronx. While she was in high school, she took an economics class that would change her life. The questions that we talked about in this class seemed so vital. She started attending Walton High School at the very beginnings of the Great Depression. All of this economic uncertainty warranted class discussions about what was going on outside in the real world. And these discussions inspired Anna Schwartz to major in economics when she went to college. I couldn't imagine wanting to pursue further study in a subject that would not have included economics. After graduating from Barnard College at the age of 18, she was that young, she went on to attend Columbia University's graduate economics program. There had been two moments in her career which had she had a different kind of personality might really have changed the course of her life. The first was in graduate school. She began work on her dissertation at the age of 21. It was a joint project with two other people, Arthur Gare and Walt Rostow. But it had its challenges. Funding for her dissertation had to be cut because of World War II and rationing of paper. This was 1941, in the middle of the war. The urgency of publishing a historical right. study <laughs> didn't seem top of the agenda. And she was told, no, I'm sorry, we can't give a PhD for a collaborative project. Ultimately, after all that work, she was denied her PhD. But Anna wasn't deterred. So my mother said, oh well. And she went off. She had taken a job at the NBER, the National Bureau of Economic Research, the nation's leading economic research center then and today. In the late 1940s, Anna began a partnership with Milton Friedman of the University of Chicago. Their initial goal was to study the effect of the U.S. money supply on business cycles. The project was exciting, but it had its major challenges. My mother was pregnant with me, child number three, and somebody at the Bureau said to her, don't do it, Anna. I mean, you're obviously gonna have this one, but stop because it's gonna undermine your productivity. Schwartz and Friedman didn't have all the data they needed, and they lived in two different states. And remember, there was no internet, and phone calls were prohibitively expensive. But again, Anna wasn't deterred. Three and a half years later, my brother Joel was born. My mother knew what she wanted to do. It was her life. She was going to make it work for herself. She scoured libraries for data. She had a, a tremendous eye for detail, very, very careful. And she had this ability to find stuff, to dig up these data sources on banks and the treasury and everything else. She did it all. All that time, she was communicating by a snail mail with Milton Friedman. Finally, in 1963, their 15-year collaboration resulted in one of economic history's greatest books, A Monetary History of the United States. It's one of the most important books of the 20th century and in terms of impact on people's research, in terms of the kinds of directions economics went. That book changed so much about the field of economics. It's changed how we teach economics. It's changed how we do research. It's changed how we think about economic policy. But you got to remember, she did this incredible amount of work, and she didn't have a PhD. So what is a monetary history of the United States? 
Among its many discoveries, the book argues that the Federal Reserve played a heavy hand in worsening, possibly even creating the Great Depression. Actions by the Federal Reserve have an effect on things we actually care about, like the real economy and employment and unemployment. It affects how much businesses want to invest, how much people want to spend. Money matters. Today, we just take that for granted, right? It just seems obvious. And what you don't realize is back in 1960, when they were writing that book, people didn't believe that. We've been able to apply that lesson, that money matters, to our great benefit. As just one example, the Great Recession of 2007 to 2009 was terrible, but it would have been a lot worse had we not learned from Schwartz and Friedman. After co-authoring this groundbreaking volume, Anna Schwartz continued to work tirelessly on different aspects of monetary policy, and she helped develop and promote an entire economic school of thought called monetarism. This school of thought eventually led to anti-inflation policies at the Fed and elsewhere in the 1970s and in the 1980s, and continues to have influence today. All told, Anna Schwartz published 10 books and more than 100 articles. She was actually very generous with her time with young economists who came to her for advice. Anna was just so brilliant and insightful and patient. But I was very lucky that I met her. She really was the best mentor anybody could have. When I was a young professor, there weren't many women, at least in my particular field of economics. I saw a woman who could make brilliant comments, contribute to papers, and be deeply respected. She was a very important role model for me. But in terms of advice to me as a family member, I think it was more just her life was an example. Her passion for economics knew no limits. Her face would just light up when she talked about economics. There was always a project that was coming up. She never retired. It's customary when someone dies to have a moment of silence in their honor. Anybody who knows Anna would know that that is exactly the wrong thing to do. The best way to honor Anna is to have vigorous debates and fierce arguments, and then to go back to your institution and do the best work you can possibly do, and then to keep doing that work for the next 50 years. Want to better understand Schwartz and the Federal Reserve? Click here for related materials and practice questions. Or check out other videos on how economists are tackling real-world problems such as the environment, poverty, and unemployment.